Well, hey there, and welcome to Grace Church. We are so glad you are joining us. If this is your first time, or maybe you're newer to Grace, special welcome to you. My name is Joel, and we're just glad that you're a part of what's going on, glad that you found us, and we'd love to get you connected to what God is doing here at Grace, uh, because we believe this, you belong. And we would love to invite you into the different spaces that we have going on. If you visit our website or our app, you'll find all the different things that you can get connected to here in the fall at Grace Church and all the excitement to come in that. But ultimately, we would invite you to join us on a Sunday morning at 1030 at our building. We'd love to have you join us for a service where you're going to meet some great people, have some good coffee, you're going to enjoy a really fun environment and be able to dive into conversation together in that format. And we would invite your kiddos. If you have kids all the way from zero to fifth grade, we have Power Kids programming on a Sunday morning during the service for them to enjoy, hang out with some friends and have a good time with each other. Cool. We are starting a series called Life with Kids. So if you're a parent, or if you know a parent, if you're an aunt and uncle, grandparent, if you're even a kid, right, this series is for you. And I'm excited to be jumping in and learning where God has us as we navigate the world of kids and parenting. So why don't you turn to Luke 15, we'll jump right in. Life with kids, right? No matter where you're at in that journey, maybe you're a kid yourself, maybe you're a parent, aunt or uncle, maybe you're just a volunteer that hangs out with kids a lot, teacher, whatever it may be, life with kids brings a lot of excitement, a lot of craziness, a lot of nerve-wracking moments, right? Here's the reality. I remember when I became a dad right? And in a lot of this conversation, we're going to talk to parents. So if you're a parent, right, hopefully this conversation is helpful for you and you might be able to relate to my experience. I remember, right, Jess, uh, she got into the hospital, right? We're going to have our first kid. I have no idea what I'm doing, right? And so uh, she had to be induced. And uh, with that um, comes a lot of different timetables and there's a lot of patience and time and all that stuff put into it. And so I remember first day we get there, right? There wasn't much movement in the kind of uh, birthing process. Let's just say that, okay? And I remember the first day I went out and got Chipotle, came back, I'm hanging out, we're watching you know, a football game, whatever, we're just kind of chilling. And then all of a sudden, like things start moving, right? And on December 31st, 2018, at like 2.43 in the afternoon, Corbin Gregory was born. And here is the reality of that moment, right? Excitement, there's a ton of like emotions behind it, there's a ton of fun behind it, right? All that good stuff. But I remember the nurse handing me Corbin, right? Jess got to hang out with him for a little bit and then they handed dad Corbin. I remember standing there holding him, looking at him and just thinking of how beautiful, how amazing, how wonderful he is and my son is and oh, I love it, right? And about 30 seconds in, I looked around the room and I, I remember thinking this, where are his parents so I can hand them off to them, right? That Because every other scenario that I have been in has been that, oh, this kid's so sweet, oh, it's a newborn baby, oh, they're you know a month old or whatever, and then you hand them back to the parents. My brain had not fully computed, right? It had not fully understood or fully grasped the fact that I was now Corbin's dad. I was a dad, a father holding my son. And here's the reality, right? As I learned, right? You don't really learn this uh, until you're in the moment. I literally had no idea what I was doing, right? And me and Jess laugh about this, right? And, and what's funny is this, is they literally, right? They sent us home with zero parental training and zero checking our house and zero checking anything else, right? And they sent us home with Corbin and said, good luck, right? And I can tell you the first few years of this process has been overwhelming, 
There's been a lot of feelings of, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel lost a lot of times, right? What's interesting is me and my wife were navigating, we're walking through the adoption process right now and the home study portion of that. And what's interesting about that is this, they are training us and they're coming around us in some really unique ways and beautiful ways. And they are preparing us and at the same time, making sure that we're suitable to adopt a kid, right? We're learning all this stuff. And yet at the same time, as much training, as much coming around, there are a number of moments in my parenting of biological kids and as we look to adopt, where I just feel lost. I just feel confused. I just feel like I don't know what I'm doing, right? And what's interesting is this, is life with kids, it can feel overwhelming, it can feel intimidating, it can feel nerve wracking, it can feel exciting and faith bending all at the same time. And I think that for many of us, whether you have your own kids or maybe you uh, help kids or maybe you interact with families that have kids or maybe you're just a kid yourself, when I talk about life with kids, that is what our life is oftentimes built around. Is that not true? You're changing diapers, you're running errands, you're going to sports practices, you're, you're healing boo-boos, right? You're potty training, you're doing homework, you got family plans. You're making sure that your kids' friends, right, that they're safe and that they're, uh, they're in the right grouping, right? All of those things, there's so much to it. And I think that as we navigate these things, right? And as we run into where life might have us in so many different veins, how we navigate God's plan inside a life with kids is so important. It just is. It's so important. And, and, and it's so important to understand what God's plan is as a parent in your kids' lives. We're gonna talk a lot about that. And if you're someone that doesn't have a kid yet, maybe you're not a parent, I want you to hone into this conversation because you are a valuable asset to come alongside of parents and kids alike. And a lot of the principles we'll talk about, a lot of the concepts we'll talk about will be applicable to you. Because no matter if you're a parent or a teacher, no matter if you're a grandparent or an aunt or uncle, no matter if you're a coach or if you're a neighbor or if you are a kid in and of yourself, like many of us are, all of us are, right? There are gonna be times where you feel lost in it. We have no idea what to do in it. We have no idea where to go with it. And I think that we need to understand this, that life with kids is recognizing the fact that I am parenting a kid who is lost, first and foremost. That the reason I can feel lost in parenting is because I'm parenting kids who are lost. We have to recognize that and sit in that. What we're gonna talk about over the course of the next four weeks is what does it look like to influence your kids' heart for the sake of the gospel? What does it look like to do life with kids and make Jesus the primary thing in the midst of that, right? And as I talk through this, I will uh, clearly take a vantage point of a parent, right? I clearly talk to parents and I'll take the vantage point of a parent and I'll be speaking to parents. But this series, like I said, is not just for parents. Tune in, find your space, find your spot, find out where you sit in this. Right? This conversation is, is just as much for someone where your season of life has you as a single mom or a single dad. Where your season of life or where God's led your journey is adoption or fostering. Maybe you're a grandparent, maybe you're an aunt or uncle, maybe you're a teacher, a volunteer, a coach, or maybe you're a kid and of yourself. What I believe is this, is that God calls all of us to invest in the next generation. And I believe that primarily that should be held and sat in by the parental seat. But we all know this, that that don't, doesn't always happen. We all know that inside of this investment into our next generation, there's a lot of different influences. And some kind of hold more weight than others. And yet, I believe the seat of parents, God has a unique calling to. And if accepted, has unique influence and investment to be given into. As we navigate this series together, we wanted to provide a number of different resources. 
We didn't want to overwhelm you necessarily, but we wanted to make sure you had resources to navigate even outside this conversation. Uh, I'll be honest, this series has been deeply inspired by a book called Parenting by Paul David Tripp, 14 Gospel Principles of Parenting. And so when I am talking through this, uh, all this series has been inspired in that way. So I'll quote him, but a lot of the thoughts and the themes and the, and the kind of trajectory of the series has been driven by this book. It's been instrumental. And they, he takes it maybe just a, a unique way comparative to a lot of the other parenting books I've read. Uh, we also will be providing an online resource where uh, you will see a kind of box that says Life with Kids Resources. Click there. It'll take you to this website where you'll find uh, resources or links to this book, uh, other books, podcasts, uh, things of that nature. If you come and visit us in person, uh, we will have multiple things for you to engage with. A series guide, a Life with Kids series guide where you as an individual can wrestle with how to invest in the next generation and how the Bible kind of speaks into that and God's word speaks into that. You, if you're a parent in particular, I would challenge you if you're in person, uh, in the back right next to the series guides, we will have what we call parent cues. And those are literally matched up to what the kids are learning so that you have weekly, daily cues to have conversations with your kids. We want, to, uh, uh, we want to encourage you and equip you to be the primary disciple makers of your kids. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. What's interesting is this, is that as I was thinking about this, and we've used a lot of these numbers before, right? But these parent cues I'm talking about, they derive from an organization called Orange that we uh, partner with and use resources from to guide our conversations in our Power Kids area. And they have uh, kind of come up with this uh, concept called the marble jar, where they have broken down how many weeks that you and I get as parents with our kids in the home before we send them out into the uh, scary, scary world per se, right? And that jar, right, that they have of marbles, uh, they say that there are 936 weeks, zero to 18 years old, roughly, okay? 936 weeks from a time a kid is zero all the way to 18 years old. So they fill that jar with 936 marbles. And their challenge is this, is to have perspective by pulling one marble out every week as a way of kind of calculating time and the kind of influence that you'll have in your kids' lives. And at every stage, that influence kind of looks different or looks unique or the investment looks different, or looks unique. And yet every week we get that time to invest in. Some of the numbers go like this. Uh, my daughter is two years old, two and a quarter roughly. She would have 816 marbles left in her jar, which is pretty significant still, right? That is a majority. We're, we're kind of at the, the you know eight ninths still there of the marbles. Corbin, who's uh, almost four now, he has 736 marbles, right? Still significant, but if you keep going. In fourth grade, okay, so we're fast forwarding significantly, your child will only have 468 marbles left or weeks left in your home. In sixth grade, there's 364 marbles left. In ninth grade, there's 208 marbles. And in 11th grade, there's 104 marbles. And then you hit senior year, and very quickly, it goes from 52, right, to 30, to 15, to 5, to 1, to they're off, right? And I think that there is some fundamental things during this series we'll talk about in the way of the vision for your parenting. What I'm going to hesitate to do is tell you a bunch of hows in lieu of telling you why and what. That I don't want to just give you the top 10 things to do as a parent and send you off because you're at different stages, you're at different environments, your kid is navigating different things. But I believe the call of parenting has to be rooted in something and the what behind it has to be drilled into for us to understand why we as parents have the investment we do. In Deuteronomy, Moses reminds the Israelites of the importance of positioning our hearts towards God and towards the gospel. And God's covenant relationship with Israel is all based in love and with us is all based in love. He's talking to the nation of Israel specifically at this time. That was God's chosen people. And he reminds them of this in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, uh, verse four through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Right? I love the words that Moses decides to use here. He says, let them be on your heart. What we're going to talk about throughout this whole series is your heart. Yes, we'll talk about your kid's heart, but we'll also talk about your heart. Because here's reality. My heart and my position, the position of my heart as a parent will dictate how I parent my kids. My position, my heart's position, will then dictate how I see my kid's heart in their life, right? We're gonna go after the heart of parenting in this series. Like I said, we're not gonna spend a lot of times on like how, okay, step number one, you do this, step number two. There's some really good books that do that really well and connect it to the why and what, but rather I wanna give you a picture of why. Why is parenting a call upon your life and why is the gospel the foundation of that? Because gospel-centered parenting it starts by believing the gospel enough to embrace the gospel enough to allow it to influence the little unplanned moments of parenting. Did you hear me there? Gospel-centered parenting starts by believing the gospel enough to embrace the gospel enough to allow it to influence the little unplanned moments of parenting. It's the whole Romans 12, 1 through 2, allowing your minds to be transformed in the image of Christ allowing your minds to be transformed in the gospel and allowing the Spirit of God to work through you. This is important because I think when we miss the why and the what, we end up actually misconstruing the how and missing on that. Judges 2 verse 10 comes a couple books after Deuteronomy. So the adults or the families that Moses was talking to there's implications to not doing this well generations to come. Judges 2.10. This is what is written in Judges. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Okay, here's, here's what we need to note in this. That is a cyclical cycle that can happen where a whole generation was raised up that didn't know the Lord or what he had done for Israel. Do you know right now that we are in the midst of that in some ways? Here in our country, and I would say across the world actually, we are seeing a very similar trend happen where a generation, generation is rising up who does not know Jesus or the good news of Jesus. Do you know that uh, shockingly enough, only about 10% of all the kids that grew up in church and graduated from high school, kind of in church, only 10% of them continue to be engaged in the church moving into their young adult life. I think about that. That is just shocking. Only about 4% of this next generation holds on to a biblical worldview right? Shocking. This next generation, right, is being bombarded with things that are coming right up against the truth of Scripture and the love of Jesus and how we hold those together. And yet, simultaneously, this generation may be the most open to spiritual faith-based conversations. And it may not always revolve around, do you go to church or not? The reality is this, that as I read Judges 2.10, I, I can sense this in maybe the cultural moment we live in, yet we cannot forget that what seems to be defeating and what seems to be depressing and what seems to be, oh, the world has won, is actually maybe what God is going to use as a harvest, what God will use to declare his gospel that we shouldn't look and say, why are they the way they are? But how can we run into them with Jesus at the forefront? I think that's the question. Because when we read this from Deuteronomy to Judges, the Israelite nation and the families of the Israelite nation lost sight of the why and the what in the process. And they lost 
influence in their kids' life and in the impact of their hearts. And whether you are a parent or you're coming around parents or you're hanging out with kids, our primary goal as parents is to believe the gospel in an effort to embrace it more for the sake of influencing for the gospel in the little unplanned moments. That in reality, whether you're a parent or you're coming around a parent or maybe you're a teen and you're influencing kids and power kids or whatever the season of life you're in, we have a chance to continually run into the next generation for the sake of the gospel. Not to tell them what they're doing wrong, but to influence their hearts in a very confusing and a very intense time for them. And I think we need to be a church asking the right question. I said this, how can we run toward the next generation instead of asking what is wrong with the next generation? And I think that starts with talking to parents. And I'm gonna invite everybody into that conversation. Because I think sometimes we're not given the tools or resources or conversations to even know where to start on this. And like I said at the beginning, that in reality, why it can feel so blinding and why you can feel lost in parenting is because you are parenting lost kids. And it starts there just fundamentally. We will talk about this, but you might even feel lost yourself spiritually as a parent. You may not know where you belong. You may not know if you believe in Jesus or not. We'll talk to that. And you are just as much welcome in this conversation as anyone. Because being lost in parenting is something that is familiar across every scope, every stage, every age, no matter what the dynamics are. And it starts with recognizing you feel lost in parenting, yes, because you have no idea what you're doing. But secondly is you, are been, you have been given a role of leading a kid who is spiritually lost themselves. Luke 15 talks about this, and I love, love, love this passage. I was reading this in my, my reading plan this week, and in, in, in parenting, Paul David Tripp talks about it in his parenting book. It's just healthy. Jesus told them this parable. Okay, we just came out of a series uh, where we were talking about these parables in the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus is trying to help them understand uh, the kingdom of God inside of this parable, but also his role inside of that. This is what the parable says, this is what he was teaching. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I love that. And I love that that is a picture of parenting. Did you see some things in there, right? It talks about shepherd and sheep, which we're going to talk a lot about. Do you notice something? That God's story is all about the redemption of his people to him. Did you notice that? He says this at the very end of that passage. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do, ne- who do not need to repent. Right? There's more rejoicing over a single individual who does a 180 because they're blown away by who Jesus is and the love he has for them and the good news and the grace and the mercy and the truth of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's more rejoicing when someone's life is utterly changed. They turn, they believe in and trust their life to Jesus and start following him. The 99 others, right? who do not need to repent, who, who maybe in some ways, right, are living based off their own righteousness and never see they're blinded to the need for repentance, right? Or just 99 people doing the right things and living in the right way. There's, exci- there's like not bad things to that, but he's like, don't you understand When someone is lost and then they are found, there is beauty to that story because they were dead in their sin, they were in a mess, and all of a sudden, life has been injected back into them. You need to know this. Parenting, parenting is 
in some ways a picture, actually let me say it this way, parenting is a picture of the redemptive story of the gospel in each of our lives. Not in some ways, it is. That you and I have a chance to influence our kids for the sake of the gospel in this redeeming, restoring way that is allowing it to take hold in my life for the sake of it taking hold in my kids' lives. Because I have been placed in their life as a role with enormous responsibility, yet with the beauty of this redemptive story that I get to play into. So how do we see that play out in parenting, okay? First is this. You have to understand, and this is not just for your child, this is for all people, but let's just talk about parenting. I'm just gonna use lingo for parenting, right? You have to understand your child will wander from what is right. You understand that? Your child will wander. I love that I'm pulling this right from what Paul Tripp was talking about. They're going to wander. And I think there's such beauty and maybe even uh, some like, um, I don't know, weight lifted off my shoulders when I say that. Because I think there is a tendency as parents to kind of create a bubble where everything's going to be safe and comfortable. And what we try to do is protect them from external things when really it's the internal thing that is going to create a lostness and a wandering. This is what Paul David Tripp would say. Remember, the greatest danger to your child is not the evil outside them, it's the sin inside them. That is the greatest of all threats to their well-being, right? But my child will wander from uh, the law of God, from what is right, from moral uh, things. And as a lost sheep, they will act like it a lot. I think that uh, I've struggled with this as a parent. Maybe you have. Uh, but as a parent, sometimes we can be like, why are they acting that way? Why are they doing that? Well, here's the reality. They're sheep. They're lost. They're wandering. They don't have any compass spiritually, right, to make that decision. And the question I would ask is this. When we're in those moments with our kids, do you care more about their heart or their moral behavior. Because what is really easy to do is look at the behavior and say, knock it off and miss their heart, right? And I think, unfortunately, as parents, we can address the evil outside of them instead of the heart inside of them. What's going on in their heart is way more divisive and really, way more dangerous than the evil that's around them and the behavior that is, is thrown out of them. And I think that comes in maybe two very distinct ways, right? Um, uh, it comes in two distinct ways. One is uh, we can become helicopter parents, right? I love this. We used to make fun of uh, my mom for this, right? She wasn't really a helicopter parent, but there were like little things that we would just joke with her about, right? But this is, this is the parent that tries to make everything comfortable and create secluded experiences for their child and, and they isolate them a little bit, right? And what we do in isolating our kids, right? If, if you just do this or if you just do what I want you to do or if you just kind of hold back here, then what we do is we assume that they're going to turn out as morally okay adults. And, and, and what I'm not saying in this is that we shouldn't be wise in protecting our kids from everything that culture has to offer. I'm not saying that like your kids probably shouldn't have cell phones at five. They probably shouldn't be reading every news uh, channel at like uh, 12. They probably shouldn't be having full access to YouTube at 16. Like there's probably some, there, there are some really good wise boundaries. But if we are trying to just create this bubble experience for them, we are assuming that the external influences are the only things that are creating kind of moral compasses inside of them or the temptation inside of them or outside of them. But in reality, it's their hearts. And our kids are a part of the problem because they're lost. That you can protect them, you can isolate them all, the, all you want. Their heart is lost. Their heart is, is blind. There, there is something going inside of here that is sinful and sin-driven. They need to hear the gospel, not be just secluded from all the different things. The second type of parent I think is this, is a heavy-handed parent. So my child wanders, if I just get them to do the right thing, or if I just tell them what the right thing is, or I just kind of force them back in, then everything is gonna be okay. And all I'm doing is addressing the moral behavior in everything. What we can do is this, we can take some, some really good kind of moral things, right? 
and we can kind of misplace the law in two ways, right? It just becomes about the law instead of about grace, which we'll talk about next. But also, we'll be tempted to replace God's law with our law and make it sound like God's law. If I get irritated or angry or frustrated with something my kid does, I can snap and make something of it that really isn't something that I should make of it. That I throw consequences around or whatever it may be according to how I want things done and it kind of makes it sound like it's, I can make it sound like it's God's way when it really may not be directly from scripture, right? And so as I think about this, right, there's, there's, there can be times where we miss and lose sight and yet having the perspective that my child is going to wander away from what is right. It's going to want, he's going to wander, she's going to wander away from the flock. And I, and I think that this, this is something that should create a compassion and a courage inside of us as parents. Because here's the reality, bent inside of my kid's heart is this, um, this temptation to buck authority. That's what sin does. So they're going to wander from you. They're going to push away from you. And what I see the shepherd do is run towards them, not just let them go. We have to have a deep compassion. Because here's the reality. Inside of our kids' heart is this nature to buck authority and to create autonomy in their life. And they're trying to navigate life and having their heart tell them this thing. And then the world over here is influencing this way. Our kids are navigating things that you and I never had to navigate. So when I talk about your child will wander from what is right, we have to hold a deep compassion towards them, while at the same time, we have to have a deep courage to address and run after them in that. I, I love the picture of Psalm 23, where the Lord is my shepherd. Um, he makes me lie down, all this stuff, and then talks about his staff, right? Staff and his rod will guide me. Right? There's something so gracious about a shepherd that has a tool that guides, not beats, but guides. That that tool of a staff was meant to guide into. And so I think about all these things. My child, inside of the context of this world, might come to me and say, I'm questioning my gender. My child might come to me and say, I'm experimenting with my sexuality. My child might come to me and say, I'm experiencing mental illness and, and, and wanting to harm myself. My child might come to me and say, they don't agree with me on this or that. They may not agree with me spiritually, or maybe. And what we have to understand is not how can I get them enclosed in an area where they don't hear anything like this, <clears throat> or that I just smack them down until they kind of agree with me, but how do I recognize their heart as they're wandering, how do I chase after their heart in that? And that's where grace comes in. Because you and I need to recognize as parents and those that are around parents and around kids, your child needs rescued by grace. That sheep are gonna wander. The beauty of the redemption story is the shepherd doesn't just let them wander. You notice what the shepherd does? He runs after her the lost sheep, and they celebrate when the sheep is found. My question to you as a parent is this, has grace ever wrecked your life? Because here's the reality. Grace tells me this, it is an undeserved gift that is paid for the penalty that I deserved and has ushered into my life a new identity that is freeing, I don't have to create that for myself, a new life that I did not create for myself, a new community that I did not create for myself, and a new purpose and mission that I did not create for myself, that you belong because Jesus took the cross for you and I and rose again. That in the reality is this, that Jesus, our great good shepherd, has been pursuing us all along by his grace. Ephesians 2.8 says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Here's the reality, that as a parent, we have to see fundamentally our children will wander, 
our kids will wander, and at the same time, they need to be rescued by grace. And what does grace do? What does is, what is love do? It invites in, and it keeps chasing after them. The reality is this. I can never, I can never extend what I haven't experienced. And, and that's not to say that you can't ever, like at some level, extend grace without full experiencing, right? But I can't extend what I haven't experienced. If I'm not sitting in the good news of Jesus every day, I will have a hard time practicing patience and kindness and love and gentleness and goodness toward my kids. And so when I think about grace rescuing our kids and the role that we have to play in that, first and foremost, it's Jesus who rescues our kids when they wander. That your kid needs to hear more about Jesus and more about his love and more about his goodness than just fixing their moral behavior because they'll only be able to do so much. That they need to hear more about Jesus' love for them and Jesus as a good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep that Jesus has come for them. Then they need to hear, you need to go do this to appease me for this or why this or shame on you for this. Reality is this, we as parents and as leaders of kids need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day so that we can preach the gospel to your child every day, so that you can model the gospel to your child every day. Because here's reality. In all of that, the tool that God uses to run after wandering sheep of kids, like kids and children, and to grace them and present them with the rescuing grace of Jesus is us as parents. Your child needs a parent to shepherd them, to love them, to be an ambassador towards them, to be a, a uh, disciple maker and a coach for them. Your child needs a parent to shepherd them. And this begins by recognizing that you are also lost and Jesus came to save you. You might be watching this and maybe spiritually you've been navigating a lot of different conversations in your life and maybe Jesus is never really connected or maybe you're just, just finding Jesus or maybe church and I don't know where you're at. Maybe this is a whole new conversation. We believe this, that every single one of us is born into this world and we're deceived into believing that we can save ourselves. Well, if I, if I just find the right identity, then, then I'll, I'll save myself and find myself. If, if I just find the right work job, then I'll just find myself and fulfill myself. If I just find the right affinity group, then I'll just find... We would say no. That actually, the gospel tells me this. That I cannot achieve anything... It's only by what I received from the God of the universe through Jesus Christ, his son, and that is by grace, grace alone. And for some of us, we sit here and we feel lost in parenting, but it actually is there's a deeper reason to feeling that. It's because we're lost spiritually. And maybe you sit here and you're like, what do you mean, shepherd your kid? I'm the sheep wandering. Well, let me just say this. We all are. And we've all wandered, and we've all wondered, and we've all questioned, we've all doubted. And you're welcome here. But maybe you're wondering, well, what do I do about that? We would say this, look to the good shepherd. Which in John 10, Jesus tells us that he is the good shepherd who came running after us, ultimately displayed on the cross by laying down his life. The shepherd became a sheep, died for us, one perfect sacrifice for all and rose again three days later so that you and I could experience a new life, could experience this new identity that is in Jesus and not dependent on my week or on anything that I've done or anything that I do or what if this or what if that and says your purpose and your mission now is to love like I've loved you. That to love me like I to love me with all your life and to love others. But you have to understand you've been loved. You've been loved so much that he's willing to give it up for you. 
you will only be able to grow in your love for your kids when you understand the amount of love that's been distributed to you through Jesus. I am a lost person in need of God's grace so I can lead another lost person into his grace. Here's the reality. I am a lost person. I've said yes to Jesus, but every day I recognize my need for God's grace in my life because I will more naturally go act like a lost person than I will a found person and a found person in his family and in his pasture. And the question I would say is this, do you see the need for the gospel in your life? Your father in heaven has sent his son to do for you what you could not do for yourself. That God loved you so much that he sent his son to take your place. And Jesus willingly went and embraced humanity and lived on this earth for you and I to experience his grace. And the question I would ask out of that is this, in light of that, do I see parenting as my most important investment in my life? Here's reality. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's handiwork. This comes right after, for it's by grace you've been saved. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I think that inside of parenting, you recognize that we're a tool that's shaping a human soul that God has privileged us to sit in. And until I see the grace of God working my life where I am lost and yet he has come after me, when I turn to him and say yes to Jesus, all of a sudden in my life he starts to connect dots for the purpose and reason and identity that I get to play in. And as I connect my life to Jesus, there's a few things that start to happen. First is this, my life becomes about him and for him, not about myself anymore. So as a parent, some of us around kids, all of a sudden my life is given over to the shaping and forming of that kid's heart. Secondly, my identity doesn't derive from my kid's success or my kid's talents or anything of that nature, it derives from Jesus. But I have to recognize that I am a child first and a parent second. We'll talk about more of this as the series goes on. But I can have an identity that's based in the gospel, not based in my achievement. And when it's based off what I receive, then I can give a whole lot more to my kids. Third is this. Do I see as a parent my primary ministry to my kids. I'll be honest, probably in the room, I, I probably have the most challenging uh, role in this, right? And I'm not saying that that uh, is because I'm more important or anything. I'm saying it because my, my, I'm a ministry leader. I got hired full-time to do ministry. And I have to come home every day and recognize that my primary ministry is to my kids and for my kids, not just not just in my church. You see your primary ministry. Because here's the reality. We are simply ambassadors to our kids. We do not own our kids. Our kids are God's. And God's entrusted us with them for the sake of the gospel, transforming their life, for the sake of them developing into disciples of Jesus Christ. Your primary goal is not to just get through a weekend, not to just get through the sports season, not just to get through breakfast or dinner together. It is to take every little moment and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ more, to embrace it more, to allow it to play out in those little moments where Johnny is screaming and you have the opportunity to go after his heart instead of after just his behavior. Where your toddler is saying no, you get to go after their heart instead of their behavior. Where you're walking the neighborhood and you run into a neighbor your kid gets to see your heart, not just some sort of behavior. Here's the reality. I think that God in such a unique way has kind of handed us the staff and said, I want you to shepherd your kids' hearts. You first got to recognize that you are a sheep in need of a shepherd who's going to grace you every day through your weaknesses, through the challenges, through the intensity of life for the sake of you being able to shepherd your kid, even in the weaknesses, even in the doubts even when you've messed up because he's going to grace you through that for the sake of your kids falling more in love with Jesus. We start here not to depress you, 
but to give you a foundation. Why is parenting so important? It's because you are the primary shepherd, disciple maker of the lost people in your home. And I would say this, let's go beyond that. You have relationship with families who do not know Jesus and the parents do not know Jesus and you can have an impact on future followers of Christ for the sake of their kids also. Thinking about the opportunities that you have to mingle with people who are lost in your environment for the sake of the gospel. So Father, we thank you so much for who you are, all that you do. We thank you for loving us, leading us. Pray over this conversation that Father, you would just lead us as we navigate parenting, life with kids, teaching, uh, coaching, whatever it may be, Father, that you would just give us uh, understanding your grace, mercy, and beauty in all of this. And Father, I pray that you would use this as you see fit. Praise you for all the kids that and students we have seen come to Jesus, be baptized, and interact in our space. And Father, we ask for your mercy and blessing upon them and that you would continue to lead us as parents and adults and leaders in their life. Father, we pray for our community, families that aren't connected to us. Father, that you would do such a work in our families that would reach into the families of the community. Father, we praise you for all that. Praise your name. Amen. So glad that you joined us. We'd love to see you next Sunday, whether here or at our building in Barberton. Have a great week.